Reverend Fathers, ladies and gentlemen, friends, my theme this morning is tradition and creativity. I'm particularly happy to be speaking on this theme here in the center dedicated to Arvo Pert, because Arvo combines in his music precisely the elements of creativity and tradition. Now, it is often thought that these two things, tradition and creativity, are in conflict. Tradition is regarded as a limitation imposed upon us from the past. It's seen as a burden that quenches creativity. And at the same time, creativity is often regarded as a repudiation of tradition in the name of originality and exploration. In reality, so it is my firm conviction, the two things are not opposed. They are complementary. It is therefore my wish in this address to investigate with you the double question, what is tradition and what is creativity? What is tradition? Let us begin with a classic definition given by one of the three greatest orthodox theologians in the 20th century, Vladimir Lossky. In case you wonder who are the other two theologians that I have in mind, they are Sergei Bulgakov and George Florovsky. Tradition, states Lossky, is the life of the Holy Spirit in the church. If we wish, we can expand Lossky's definition, giving it a Christological as well as a pneumatological reference. Tradition, we may say, is the life of Christ ever present in the church through the Holy Spirit. But whichever de description of tradition we prefer, let us note an essential element that they have in common. Tradition is life. In any interpretation of what tradition signifies in orthodoxy, this certainly is a crucial point. Tradition, rightly understood, is not static, but dynamic. Not repetitive and immobile, but pioneering and experimental. It is not merely a deposit inherited passively from earlier generations, but it is also Christ speaking to us here and now at this present moment. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, as is said in the epistle to the Hebrews. Always unchanged, tradition is ever new, always living. To appreciate the implications of Lossky's definition of tradition as life, let us examine a possible image of what tradition might signify. An image that, however, turns out to be inadequate and misleading. In Vladimir Solovyov's short tale of Antichrist, the emperor, who is Antichrist, 
offers different gifts to the various Christian groups. To the Roman Catholics, he promises that the Pope will be reinstated with all the rights and privileges that he had ever enjoyed from the time of Constantine the Great onwards. To the Protestants, he promises to found a world institute for free inquiry into the scriptures from every possible point of view and every possible direction with an annual budget of one and a half million marks, a sum that would have been far more valuable in Solovyev's time than it is today. And what does the emperor, who is Antichrist, offer to the Orthodox? The Orthodox who pride themselves as constituting the church of holy tradition. Dear brothers, he says, I know that there are among you some who value most in Christianity its sacred tradition, ancient symbols, ancient hymns and prayers, icons and holy rites. And what indeed can be more precious to a religious mind. Know then, beloved, that today I have signed the statute and settled large sums of money on the World Museum of Christian Archaeology in our glorious imperial city of Constantinople for the object of collecting, studying, and preserving all relics of church antiquity, especially the Eastern. Here, with acute shrewdness, and indeed with an evident touch of humor, Solovyov singles out an attitude to tradition that is all too common among us Orthodox. Tradition is seen in Solovyov's tale as a kind of archaeological museum, an assemblage of artifacts from the distant past. Adapting this image, we might choose to envisage tradition as a library with rows of leather-bound volumes ranged in bookshelves from floor to ceiling. In this way, tradition is regarded as written words, as texts and documents handed down from antiquity, studied by specialists in ecclesiastical assemblies and academies. Such an image is not altogether incorrect, for tradition is indeed something partly recorded in writing. Tradition is first and foremost the written testimony of scripture, which forms the fundamental element in holy tradition. Observe here that I do not make a contrast between scripture and tradition. I do not treat them as two distinct sources of revelation but I envisage scripture as existing within tradition. Along with the words of scripture, tradition comprises the decrees and canons of the seven ecumenical councils, together with the later conciliar decrees and the writings of the fathers. Yet, while partly correct, at the same time, the identification of tradition with words recorded in books is gravely defective, for it is in danger of suggesting that tradition is something antiquated and ossified, remote in time, fixed and unmoving, and rightly understood, tradition is none of these things. 
Lasky's view of tradition as a living reality, alive, contemporary, is confirmed by the great Romanian theologian, Dimitri Stanilawe, who insists, tradition in the Orthodox Church is not a sum of propositions, but a lived experience. It is, he affirms, nothing else than the uninterrupted life of the church. We note, as before, the emphasis upon life. Tradition is life. In the words of Losky's disciple, the French Orthodox author Olivier Clément, there is no tradition that is not living and creative through a union of human freedom with the grace of the Holy Spirit. Tradition, it may even be said, is Pentecostal, the continual re-experiencing of the mystery of Pentecost throughout the history of the church. What a true loyalty to tradition requires from us is not mechani mechanical acceptance, but a challenging and radical reliving of the faith once delivered to the saints. As Georges Florovsky maintains, tradition is not only a protective, conservative principle, it is primarily the principle of growth and regeneration. We do not simply remain in the tradition through an automatic inertia. The true traditionalist is not one who sits still, but a pilgrim and an adventurer. Losky goes so far as to call tradition the critical spirit of the church. Loyalty to tradition signifies that we honor the past, but we are at the same time challenged to question the past. Not everything handed down from previous eras is necessarily true. It may be no more than a theological opinion, a pious convention, even a corruption, not an integral part of holy tradition. Christ said, I am the truth. He did not say, I am custom. Orthodoxy, when faithful to itself, does not passively identify traditions in the plural with a lowercase t, with the one holy tradition in the singular with an initial capital. What is demanded from us is a vigorously renewed act of diacrisis, of discernment and discrimination between the two, between the one holy tradition and the many ephemeral traditions within the church. In any estimate of tradition, one of the key words is today, as it says in the Psalms. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Tradition is not merely a record of God's deeds in the past, but an encounter with Christ through the Holy Spirit in the immediate present. Tradition is continuing and contemporary. Traditionalism requires us to listen to what the Spirit has said to our predecessors, 
but it also invites us to listen to the voice of the Spirit to us personally here and now. Let us recall how Christ inaugurated his public preaching in Nazareth. In the local synagogue, he read the words from the book of Isaiah, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Then, closing the book with the eyes of all fixed upon him, as they waited with eager expectation to discover what this new prophet had to say. Jesus continued, Today this scripture is fulfilled. Today that is the first word in the public preaching of Christ in Nazareth. And it's the first word to you and me at this moment. Today, faithfulness to tradition is to sense with the utmost vividness what Christ meant when he spoke of the Spirit in this way and used the key word today. This indeed was something that was clearly understood by the Desert Fathers at the dawn of monasticism, as we learn from sayings such as this. An old man said, this voice cries to humankind until our last breath. Repent today. Elsewhere, it is recounted in the sayings of the Desert Fathers, it was said of an old man that when his thoughts said to him, relax today and tomorrow repent, he retorted, no, I am going to repent today and may the will of God be done tomorrow. Repent today. Such exactly is the path of salvation for all of us, whether we are living in the desert or in the city or here in the forest. The importance of today is evident in an incident recorded in the life of the Orthodox Apostle of America, St. Herman of Spruce Island in Alaska, who died in 1836. Once, when a vessel of the Russian Navy called at Spruce Island, he was invited on board to eat with the captain and the officers. In their conversation, they began to speak in turn about the thing that mattered most to each of them. Some spoke of their hopes of promotion, others of their longing to return safely home to their wife and children. Finally, they appealed to St. Herman. Let me beg this of you, my friends, he replied. From this day, from this hour, from this minute, let us strive to love God most of all. From this day, from this hour, from this minute, we are to love God not in the indefinite future, not next week, not tomorrow, but today, at this present moment, here and now. Holy tradition involves exactly this sense of immediacy. Tradition is always contemporary. In speaking thus as an orthodox concerning the immediacy of tradition, we have moved a long way from the notion of tradition as a library of leather-bound volumes 
in an archaeological museum. This same point is forcefully underlined when we consider the attitude to tradition that is to be found in the New Testament. Sometimes tradition is viewed in ambivalent and even negative terms, as when Jesus draws a distinction between the traditions of the elders and the commandment of God, and accuses the scribes and Pharisees of making void the word of God through your tradition, which you have handed down. In similar terms, St. Paul refers to the traditions of my fathers, in which he's been brought up, but which he does not seek to impose upon Gentile converts. In this context, Paul makes an emphatic contrast between the truth according to Christ and empty deceit according to human tradition. Colossians 2.8. Elsewhere, however, St. Paul speaks about tradition in more positive terms, especially in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. In this passage, he states, I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And so he goes on speaking of the Holy Eucharist. Now, while the noun tradition, paradosis, does not occur here, Paul uses the related verb, paradidone, meaning to deliver or to hand on. Two points emerge clearly from his statement. First, the tradition that is delivered or handed on is specifically said to be derived from the Lord Christ. Second, and most significantly, that which is handed on is not a verbal formula, but an action, the celebration of the Holy Eucharist. Tradition for Paul denotes not only and not primarily words or intellectual concepts, but an action, an operation, the action and operation of the Lord's Supper of the divine liturgy. Such is the true character of tradition. It is sacramental, mysterial, and liturgical. Tradition means the Eucharistic Christ. When our Lord said, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood, abides in me and I in him. He was speaking precisely about holy tradition. Here then is an image that takes us far closer to the heart of the matter than our earlier notions of a library. Thinking of tradition, we should picture to ourselves not books in a library, not artifacts in a museum, but rather a table, and on the table a plate and a cup with bread on the plate and wine in the cup. We should likewise picture Christ the Savior standing at the table and addressing each one of us, take, eat, drink of it, all of you. Tradition is not just verbal affirmations and written texts, 
not just theories and teachings. Tradition is truth. And for those who are Christians, truth is not an idea, but a person. I am the truth, says Christ. Truth, and therefore tradition, is hypostatic and personal. Tradition is always the Lord Jesus speaking to us here and now, unceasingly active in the church from generation to generation, present through the celebration of the divine liturgy, offering us his life-creating body and blood. Tradition means the love of Christ's incarnate, affirmed on the cross, reaffirmed in the resurrection, and communicated to us in the holy gifts. If then we desire to be faithful to tradition, let us seek above all to have a devoted, intense and vivid Eucharistic life. Let us become in everything that we do, living sacraments, Eucharistic persons. Traditionalism means nothing less than that. From all that we've said so far, it is surely evident that tradition, properly understood, is to be seen, yes, as living and contemporary, unchanging but inventive, obedient to the past but open to the future, involving a critical ressourcement in the present. In this way, there is, or at any rate, there should be, no conflict within our church life between tradition and creativity. On the contrary, each entails the other. It is true that the word creative, in Greek, demiurgikos, is not to be found in the Old Testament Septuagint or in the Greek New Testament, although it occurs with some frequency in patristic writings from Clement of Alexandria and Origen onwards. Yet, while the actual words creative and creativity may be absent from the text of Scripture, yet the reality that these words express is to be found already in the very first chapter of the Old Testament, where it is said, let us make humankind. The word in Hebrew there is Adam, and in the Greek, Anthropos. Let us make humankind in our image after our likeness. Genesis 1:26. This text sums up the fundamental message of Christian anthropology in its entirety. And what it implies is exactly the gift of creativity. It has to be admitted, however, that it is not at once evident what exactly is signified by the phrase, in our image, after our likeness. The meaning of this is not explicitly spelt out either in scripture or in the dogmatic decrees of the seven ecumenical councils. As Epiphanius of Salamis, writing in the fourth century, correctly asserts, it cannot be denied that all humans are in the image of God. But we do not inquire too inquisitively how they are in the image. As he observes elsewhere, tradition holds that every human being is in the image of God. But it does not define precisely in what aspect of our personhood this image is to be located. Manifestly, 
The question of what is meant by a person is implied in the controversies in the early church concerning the Trinity and the Incarnation. If it is claimed that God is a triunity of three hypostases or personae, at once this involves our understanding of what is meant by these terms, hypostasis or persona. Likewise, if it is said that the incarnate Christ is one single person in or from two natures, that again raises the question how we interpret the unity of the human person. But while these questions are implicit in the patristic discussions, they are not explicitly answered in a systematic fashion. That is a task that the early fathers left for future generations. There is one particular interpretation of Genesis 1.26 that we may quickly discard. The text of Genesis, after affirming that humans are in God's image, goes on to link that image with the idea of kingly rule over the rest of creation. Let them, that's humankind, have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth. From this, certain Christian writers, members for the most part, of the Antiochene school, such as Diodor of Tarsus, but also including a Western writer such as Ambrosiaster, have concluded that since dominion and kingly rule are characteristic of the male rather than the female, women are not fully and completely in God's image and likeness. Fortunately, this is not the invariable opinion of patristic authors. St. Gregory of Nazianzus, Gregory the Theologian, and St. Augustine, among others, maintain with great emphasis that women and men are equally in the divine image, and we will surely agree with them. On this point, manifestly, we have clear support from the text of Genesis. For instance, it is unambiguously affirmed, so God created humankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. There is no suggestion here that women possess only a subordinate and incomplete participation in the image. What then does this mean in the image and likeness? One point is obvious from the outset. As St. Athanasius of Alexandria observes, since God is creator, the fact that we humans are in the image of God means that the human person is likewise a creator. Each human being, to use the phrase employed by J.R.R. Tolkien, is a sub-creator. It is true that while God's creative power is absolute and unlimited, our human power to create is restricted in many ways, especially in a fallen world. God creates from nothing, ex nihilo. This is not the case with us humans. Yet, between God's supreme power as creator and our relative and fallen creativity as humans, there is not certainly an identity but at least a resemblance, an analogy. 
what is implied by this analogy. What then may be said in more positive terms about creativity? The fact that we are human beings created in God's image plainly implies that there exists in our human nature an orientation, a sense of direction. Image and likeness signify relationship. Because we are essentially in God's image, our human personhood cannot be defined and interpreted exclusively in terms of itself as a self-contained, autonomous entity. It is a mistake to attempt to construct a two-story anthropology, first defining our personhood solely in terms of our created nature, and then considering our relationship with God in an appendix as a mere afterthought. No, our Godward orientation has to be kept in view from the very start. We humans do not contain the mystery of our selfhood only within ourselves. Not until we see ourselves in our relationship with God does our personhood acquire its true authentic significance. Without God, we humans are unintelligible. Our human nature, deprived of a relationship with God, is not normal, but abnormal. Not truly human, but subhuman. To be created in the divine image means that we are created for communion and dialogue with God. And if we ignore and repudiate that communion and dialogue, we are denying our own true self. Affirming the human, we also affirm God. Denying God, we also deny the human. In that sense, the theist is the only consistent humanist. In this connection, I recall a meeting that I attended in Oxford some 60 years ago, addressed by the well-known Staretz, Father Sophroni, disciple of Saint Silvan the Athenite and founder of the Monastery of St. John the Baptist at Tolleson Nights in Essex. Recently, to our great joy, Father Sophroni was glorified as a saint by the ecumenical patriarch. On this particular occasion in Oxford, as the discussion drew to a close, the chairman invited one last question. That is always a dangerous moment. All too often, the last question turns out to be meaningless or unanswerable. On this occasion, someone at the back of the audience, the room was packed, posed the query, tell me, Father, what is God? At once, Father Sophroni replied, first, can you tell me what is man? Yes, indeed, the two questions are inseparable. Human personhood and divine personhood are complementary and intertwined. Each illuminates the other. Together with Godward relationship, at least three other things are implied in our human creativity, in our human possession of the divine image. 
freedom, growth, and self-awareness. First then, freedom. As God is free, so the human person in God's image is free. Needless to say, we are not to overlook the vital discrepancy between uncreated and created freedom. The first is unconditioned, whereas our human liberty in this fallen world is limited in many ways by heredity and environment, by our own past actions, by the influence of our unconscious motives. Yet, despite every restriction, our human liberty has not ceased to be a reflection, dim yet genuine, of the transcendent Trinitarian liberty. Endowed with this sovereign freedom, each of us is king or queen of the creation according to the divine icon. We are never to lose sight of this iconic liberty that is our birthright. One of the questions asked by the Jewish Hasidim was this, what is the worst thing that the evil urge, Yetzahara, can achieve? And the answer is, to make us forget that we are each the child of a king. Because in this way we actualize the divine image through the exercise of our free will, this explains why we humans are all of us different, why each of us is unique. We are not interchangeable tokens, mechanical copies of each other, repeatable programs on a computer. But we have, all of us, the God-given vocation of creating something beautiful in our own distinctive way. There is a Jewish saying, God never does the same thing twice. That is certainly true so far as we humans are concerned. From this it follows that the world has need of every single human being. Not a single one of us is superfluous or expendable. For God has for each a different plan and a special love. In this sense, we are, each one of us, an endangered species. I recall how in our Orthodox parish in Oxford, the young son of one of our parishioners was watching a television program on endangered species. And afterwards, he seemed rather silent. His mother said to him, is there anything wrong? Yes, he said, I am important, aren't I? I too am an endangered species. There's only one of me in all the world. So yes, each one of you in this room is an endangered species because there's only one of you in all the world. Along with freedom, a second aspect of the divine image is our human potentiality for growth. In the Hebrew original and in the Septuagint text of Genesis 1.26, the two words image, ikon, and likeness, homeosis, are probably intended as synonyms. 
The double phrase may simply be an example of the stylistic parallelism characteristic of the Old Testament. Many patristic authors, however, although by no means all, envisage a difference between the two terms. The first to do so is St. Irenaeus of Lyon. St. Clement of Alexandria, followed by Origen, takes up the distinction. Some of our writers, states Clement, have understood that humans received that which is according to the image immediately at their creation. Whereas that which is according to the likeness, they look forward to receiving in the future at their perfection. The distinction is expressed with particular clarity by St. Maximus the Confessor. Every rational nature is in the image of God, but only the righteous and the wise are in his likeness. According to this interpretation, the image denotes our essential humanity, the basic characteristics possessed by every one of us, simply by virtue of the fact that we are human. Although occluded by sin, both inherited and personal, the image is never entirely lost. The likeness, on the other hand, is attained only by the saints, who through God's grace have reached the fullness of deification. Image is to likeness as starting point to end point, or as potentiality to realization. The image is protological, the likeness is eschatological. Such an exegesis of Genesis 126 posits an intensely dynamic view of what it is to be a human person. Homo viator, to be human is to be on a journey from the image to the likeness. A fundamental element in personhood is growth. This is emphasized by modern psychology, but it's also emphasized by the early fathers. Personhood, according to the divine image, signifies ceaseless inner discovery, ever new beginning, unremitting self-transcendence. Human nature, according to the likeness of the infinite God, it always betokens possibilities as yet unrealized. The divine icon that renders us authentically human is not closed and confined within predetermined frontiers. Rather, it involves openness to an unknown future, a call that is constantly renewed in unexpected ways, a vocation still to be more fully explored. Beloved, says St. John, at this moment, we are already the children of God. But what we shall be in the future has not yet been revealed to us. That's a free translation of 1 John 3, 2. Forgetting what lies behind, affirms St. Paul, I reach forward to what lies ahead. Philippians 3.14. According to St. Gregory of Nyssa, this reaching forward, in Greek, epektasis, 
does not come to an end with our death, but it will continue into all eternity from glory to glory. Modern authors speak appropriately of an end without end. Roads go ever, ever on. I was speaking about this theme of infinite progress uh, some time ago to an English audience, and afterwards an elderly lady came up to me and said, I found your remarks deeply depressing. I was a little surprised because I thought I'd been rather eloquent. But she said to me, I have had a hard and busy life and I do hope that after death I shall have a good rest. Well, we do talk about requiem eternam, eternal rest. But I prefer to think of the life after death as a continuing discovery. St. Irenaeus says, even in the age to come, God will always have new things to tell us, and we shall always have new things to learn. Even in the age to come, even in eternity, we can never say to God, you are repeating yourself. We have heard it all before. Throughout all eternity, God will remain a God of surprises, teaching us new things. From growth, I turn to the third quality linked with creativity. And here we come to the most important point of all. The divine image inscribed upon us denotes our conscious self-awareness, our faculty of reason, our capacity for intuitive insight, our sense of good and evil, and all that is included in the notion of the conscience. Fashioned in the image of Christ the Logos, we humans are logi key, endowed with a yearning for coherence and meaning. Christ our creator Logos is Sophia, wisdom, the principle of order and intelligibility throughout the universe. So we human persons, by virtue of the divine image marked upon us, are Sophianic beings, capable of thinking, speaking, and acting with aspiration and deliberate purpose. The other animals live in the world, guided by their instinctive urges. But we human animals, while likewise swayed by our instincts, do not only live in the world, but we make conscious choices involving motivated decisions, determining how we are to live in the world. By virtue of our capacity for reflection, a capacity that expresses our God-given endowment with the divine image. We can shape and refashion the world, bestowing upon it new meaning and value, giving the creation a voice, rendering it articulate in the praise of God, and offering the creation back to God with thanksgiving. This we do, above all, at the Eucharistic liturgy, when the priest says, Thine own, from thine own, we offer unto thee in all things and for all things. It is noteworthy that in the Eucharist we offer not grains of wheat, 
but bread, not bunches of grapes, but wine. We offer, that is to say, God's creation back to the Creator, but we offer it back not in its original state, but transformed by human hands. In this way, God's creation is invested with a new significance. And through this offering, we become ourselves as priests of the creation. Thus, the human animal is par excellence, a liturgical animal created to be a cosmic liturgist, an offerer. Without this attitude of voluntary and creative offering, joyful and sacrificial, without the element of thanksgiving, none of us is truly personal. It has, of course, to be admitted that many of the animals also shape and refashion the world to a limited extent. We are not to assert too sharp a distinction between ourselves and the other animals. Bees construct honeycombs. Beavers build dams. Yet in doing this, they are not inspired, so far as we can judge, by a conscious act of self-awareness and equally by a conscious act of God-awareness in the way that is the case with us humans. In this connection, I recall an occasion when I was returning from France, attracted by the picture of a squirrel on the label of a bottle I had bought it as a gift, this bottle of liqueur for my mother, a liqueur made from nuts. This led me to reflect how squirrels collect nuts, how they store them for sustenance during the winter, how they forget where they've put their stores, how they quarrel with other squirrels about which store belongs to whom. In all these respects, they display what might be considered somewhat human characteristics. But there is one thing that squirrels do not do, so far as I am aware. They do not make a liqueur out of nuts. That is something that only we humans can do. And this we do by virtue of the divine image marked upon us. Actually, the liqueur was rather nasty. I would much rather have eaten the nuts in their natural state. And this leads me to reflect on another point. We humans have the power to transfigure the world, making the creation articulate in praise of God in a way that the other animals cannot do. But we also have the power as fallen and sinful creatures to disfigure the world, marring the beauty of creation, turning the things which God created very good into objects that are repulsive and toxic. And this is something that on the whole is fortunately not done by the other animals. <coughs> While we humans have the gift to rise much higher than the other animals, we also have the possibility to fall much lower. Squirrels may not make liqueurs, but neither do they make atom bombs. In this fallen world of ours, there exists not only a positive creativity, according to the divine image, but also a pseudo-creativity that is deeply negative, according to the image of someone different from God.
bearing in mind what was said earlier about tradition as living and contemporary and not just a passive conformity with the past. And bearing in mind what we have also said about creativity as expressed through freedom, through exploratory growth, and through conscious self-awareness, it will now, I hope, be evident that the two do not exclude or contradict one another. But on the contrary, there is a vital convergence between them. The two cooperate together. Each reinforces the other. Our re reliving of tradition should always be creative. And at the same time, our creativity is to be exercised within the context of living tradition, acting with wide-ranging freedom, always reaching forward to what lies ahead, guided in our self-awareness by the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking within us, we become conscious more and more vividly of the way in which we live and act creatively within tradition. To be a true traditionalist is to experience with ever-increasing force our ability to be genuinely creative. What is tradition? It is creative life. And what is creativity? It is the ceaselessly expanding consciousness of tradition. As a final symbol that expresses the affirmative character of both tradition and creativity, let us recall what Greek Orthodox used to do on the opening day of Lent, known as Clean Monday, Kathara Devtera. On this day, they used to celebrate, perhaps they still do, the first outdoor festival of the year. Taking a picnic, they went out onto the hills and they flew kites. That surely expresses the deeper meaning of tradition. Does not our loyalty to tradition invite us to go out spiritually onto the hills, to rejoice in the fresh air, to clear our mind from dust and cobwebs, to experience the wind of the Holy Ghost blowing on our faces, and so to fly noetic kites. By the same token, creativity likewise signifies to fly kites in the open sky. Tradition expressed through creativity and creativity exercised within tradition will guide us on the path which leads to the kingdom of heaven. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, for this uh, wonderful talk. And uh, uh, yesterday, uh, when uh, we had the conversation and um, mentioned that uh, we uh, cannot really answer the question of what creativity is, uh, Metropolitan Callista said that uh, you will find all answers in my talk. And uh, uh, 
I think we could finish on this note and just go on the hill and fly kites. <laughs> but we still have uh, several more papers today. And uh, I, uh, we are running slightly at, uh, behind the schedule, but uh, it would be uh, unfair not to uh, allow people to ask uh, questions that have uh, arisen during uh, listening to this talk. So please. Uh, uh, questions and comments, uh, and there will be microphone here, so in any language, so that there will be translation. Thank you, Vladiko. I would just like to confirm that people in Greece, at any rate, still do fly kites on the Katheri Dehtera. So creativity is not dead, at least in Greece. Yes, I... I I cannot hear very well. So. Uh, Father Ivan said that people in eastern Greece still fly kites uh, on that day, so creativity is uh, still uh, alive. <laughs> well, thank you, yes. Good. You agree with what I said at any rate, <laughs> so I'm pleased to hear that. Father, as we're in uh, uh, Estonia, I thought I would share uh, one of the wonderful sort of uh, connections that the Estonian language makes with what you were saying about today, because uh, I don't know whether this is chance, I don't think it is, but the word, but the word for uh, today in Estonian is Tana, uh, is uh, linked with the word tanama, to thank. And so uh, it, it seems that this Eucharistic life of the church is, is one, uh, as we give thanks, we are, uh, as it were, celebrating today. The, every new day, every daily bread is, uh, is an opportunity to be thankful and to live Eucharistic lives. Thank you very much. I, as you will appreciate, consider that the attitude of thanksgiving, of gratitude, is fundamental to our nature as human beings. If we are not grateful, we are not truly human. It's very interesting to reflect how we begin each day. Now, in the traditional view of time, the liturgical view, the day uh, does not start at midnight or when we get up in the morning. The day starts in the evening. As it says in the Genesis creation account, the evening and the morning were the first day. The evening comes before the morning. So Vespers is not an epilogue concluding the day. Vespers is the first service of the new day. And how in the Orthodox Church do we start Vespers? During almost all the year, except just after Easter, we begin Vespers in the same way by reading or singing Psalm 103, or in the Hebrew numbering used in the Protestant churches, 104. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. And we go on in that psalm of introduction at Vespers to speak of the wonders of creation. How marvelous are thy works, O Lord, we say in the psalm. In wisdom hast thou made them all. So this exactly is the way in which we begin the new day, by thanking God for the gift of the created world, offering the world back to God in thanksgiving. This is very significant that the first liturgical act is not actually an act of repentance, 
to express our sinfulness, it is an act of joyful gratitude. So that would be exactly the lines along which I am thinking, as you also are doing. Thank you. Uh, yes, please. And maybe that will be the last question before the, before the coffee break. As a child, I found it very irritating that the Holy Bible constantly told me, give God the new song. As I liked my yesterday's song well enough, I didn't uh, like the command. But now I I'm at the beginning of the journey of understanding that God wants us to be in constant movement in our creation. I am an artist and it's a very useful tool to use. Do you agree? Now, again, I find it difficult to hear with the loudspeaker. Can you just uh, summarize? So, uh, she says that it, it, she read in the Bible uh, uh, that we should give God a new song and she found it... Uh, we should it, be more... We should give the God new song. Yes. And she found it irritating and because she felt that the old song was good enough. But now she realized that uh, God wants us to be in constant movement as, as an artist. So she feels that's, that's the right uh, um, understanding. So, so you were speaking of the value of music, of song. Is that right? Um, uh, any act of uh, cre cre any creative art. I'm a painter. She's a she's an artist. Yes. Well, I certainly think that all creative work is offering back the world to God, and that is what the musician is doing, but also what the artist is doing. Yes, and. The ability to paint icons is, of course, a very direct reflection of what it is to be in the image or icon of God. The word image or icon is used on at least three different levels. First of all, it's said in Scripture, Colossians 1.15, that Jesus Christ is the icon of God the Father. So Christ is the fundamental icon. But then it's said that we humans are formed according to the image and likeness, according to the icon of God. So we are icons of Christ the icon. And then on a third level, we have the ability in many different ways but particularly through the making of icons to express what the icon means. So we humans are icons of the icon, and because we are icons, we can make icons. In this way, we are expressing what something that is fundamental to our humanity. But the same would be true also of poetry and music, and indeed of scholarly work. Indeed, in all that we teach, there should be this sense that we are expressing our gratitude for God who has made us in his image. But particularly the painting of icons expresses what it means to be human. Thank you very much uh, again. And uh, let's thank uh, uh, again uh, Metropolitan Callistus and then we could have a break. <laughs> <laughs>